Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, I don't want to keep you too long tonight, but um, just want to give a welcome also to everybody joining us on uh, on the webcast and uh, podcast. And uh, thanks, thanks for being with us, people from the Rock and beyond. We bless you. I want to talk to you about something tonight that um, has with it certain complexities that some of you, when I give you the subject, will say, why? But that's only because of the way you're wired. Uh, some of you are wired a little differently, so, so your thinking will, will be made to wrestle a little bit, a little bit um, more. Now, I may also say that in 30 minutes, there's no way that I can give you a... Uh, full, expounded, theological, biblical um, context to this. So we're going to mess with it, though, because it's very important. But it starts out with the story. Uh, two weeks ago, as of yesterday, uh, when Chris and I were in, uh, in the U.S. on our, on our uh, pilgrimage, which Chris talked some about last week, and there are just lots of just incredibly powerful, prophetic significant stuff that we still need to talk through, and some of it in smaller groups with leaders, um, but very, very significant. And uh, we are on a very strong flow of the prophetic at the moment, which is bothering me because I'm seeing things I don't really want to see and knowing things I don't want to know. But uh, we're in that phase, and God is with us, and I feel the prophetic me is coming to the surface again, and, uh, you know, for whatever that's worth. So you might not want to clap. Uh, but anyway, two weeks ago, as of yesterday, we're on the pilgrimage. We, we're driving along Interstate 80 between, uh, we're going uh, um, east to west, driving along from Wyoming <coughs> into Utah. And um, just about when we got to the, the Wyoming Utah state line on Interstate 80, <clears throat> and uh, I'm driving along at 80 miles an hour on the, the interstate. Suddenly Chris says, look, and she points to the right, and they're on the right. As we're passing, we're going through a kind of a canyon with, with um, uh, like sandstone rock walls going way up, I mean, way up high next to the road, which makes quite a lot of that road. As Chris pointed there, and my eye then caught what she was seeing, down this rock sheer face was coming a rock slide of some considerable proportions, which at that point was probably, um, it, it was probably 15 to 20 feet above the road and uh, a bit about where Mike and Leanne are sat. So you have split seconds. It's, it's this big chunk of mountainside coming down. So um, it's funny in those moments because you really do need some divine inspiration because your choice is going to make the difference between life and death or serious injury at best. And uh, I'm sure you can imagine the kind of damage that would be created even if you arrived where that rockfall was coming at approximately the same time and those rocks were coming through the windscreen at 80 miles an hour. You, you can imagine it's good night, sweetheart. You know, you, you are not just going to get a bruise on your head from that. Of course, the other thing is if you, if you arrive a split second later, it's either going to knock you clean off the road because your car might seem big, but, but when, when you've got rocks coming against it at speed, it, it's not. Or alternative to that, I was saying to Chris, I'd have been okay, you were in the passenger side, it's coming in your window. Uh, so I could have been widowed quite easily. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating this, you know, Chris will tell you it was. In that moment, um, I believe I had a clear word from God. Your natural reaction is to break, okay? You see something coming, your natural reaction is break. If I had braked, we would have been right where the rock slide came across the road. But something in my spirit said, accelerate. So I put my foot down. Thankfully, we're in a very powerful five-liter car. So immediately, I was up over 100 miles an hour. And literally, as I... Uh, 
just apprehensive, trying to watch the road, watch this. I looked in my mirrors, I looked in my mirror. These rocks literally bounced just behind the back of the car. Thankfully, most of them across the road into the central ravine. Um, thankfully, the truck that was following us was probably 200 meters behind us. So by the time he had arrived at where we had been, there were just some rubble and debris on the road. Um, but we escaped with beating hearts, um, unharmed, and uh, gradually settled down, but being very grateful that we had been delivered. Now, there are issues about situations like that which, which I want to talk about tonight because, because I want to talk about favor. Um, there are times, I believe, when we must be reminded, we must recollect, we must recognize the favor of God at work in our lives. Now, I know there are issues here because uh, someone could say, what if it had been another car at another time and the rocks had hit the other car and the people had died and what if they weren't believers in God? And uh, Yeah, I, I accept all that, but um, how many of you on Christmas Day, when you are given a gift from a loved one say, I can't even look at it or open it because there are children in bomb cities in Syria today who will be getting nothing. How many of you did that? How many of you got on and opened the gift because in that moment it was important to you? Okay. How many of you this lunchtime said, thank you for preparing lunch for me or in the restaurant, but said, but I can't eat this food because there are starving children in Eritrea. Okay, so we can all get very philosophically self-righteous uh, about, about issues like this one, um, while actually then merrily going along hypocritically with everything else, not carrying through with integrity the same thought. Now, I don't condemn that because we should think and be very sensitive when we talk about what we believe was the favor of the deliverance of God on our lives, we should be sensitive of what that might interpret as to others and whether we have gained a full grasp of what it was we were talking about. So I'm trying to unpack this for two reasons. One, because I feel it would not be right to honor God for what I believe was favor on our lives in that moment to inspire me what to do to deliver our lives from disaster. So I'm going to give thanks to God for that for that moment, for that situation, for that issue of preservation. Now, so often we feel things did not happen how we would have liked, yet we're so often blind to the true facts of how much worse things could have and would have been without the favor of God around and over our lives. So there's a second category to this, that sometimes things don't work out how we think they, we think they should, but we've lost sensitivity to potentially how much worse and how much more difficult and disastrous it could have been had the situation we find ourselves not been a reality for us. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so I'm trying to give you the different aspects of this. In, in the Bible, the word for favor in the New Testament is the same word as the word translated gift and grace. It's the word charis, from which we get our word charisma and charismatic. So there's a little clue there about what the favor of God means in that the same word translated favor is also translated gift and grace. So favor is a gift of grace into our lives. With that in mind, we need to look at a couple of things. Favor is not what happens when you get things right. Reward is what happens when you get things right. I want you to understand this, so I'm going to say it again. Favor is not what happens when you get things right. Reward is what happens when you get things right. And that's what happens to the godly and the ungodly to preachers and atheists, to Christian businessmen and drug barons, 
our assumption is that because some things work, it must have been the favor of God, but I would say some of it isn't. It's just you did it right. So we can have, for example, a Christian doing something and succeeding in their exams at college, and the atheist kid next to them succeeding equally well in their exams at college. Now, you could say, well, you did what was right, so you were rewarded. They did what was right, so they were rewarded. That was not favor. Now, it can get quite complex because we can think in deals that we do in life, you know, in life, in relationships, in business, that that was the favor of God. It might not have been the favor of God because I could argue the fact that drug barons make billions, have big houses, big cars, and lots of stuff in the same way that a believer could do that. So it's not necessarily the favor of God. So we must be careful not to confuse doing what is right and that right action being rewarded with favor, which is akin to grace and gift, okay? Now that doesn't mean grace and gift and favor weren't mixed in, but we have to be real careful because if we go down that track, then it can appear that somebody is not in the favor of God because they did not succeed at something that we thought they should have succeeded at. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? So there's a sensitivity there. So I would like to argue that favor is what happens when you get things wrong in all the right ways. Now think about that. It's pink. Favor is something that happens when you get things wrong in all the right ways. You see, it's a gift. It's something bestowed upon you. It's not something you earn. It's not a reward for your cleverness or your good decisions. So therefore, all of us actually become possible beneficiaries of the favor of God in the most remarkable way. So, a few things. Favor should not be confused with skill. Okay, this is important. If you're good at the thing, whatever that thing may be, favor should not be confused with skill because skill will produce a result. I could give you verses from products. Skill will produce a result, okay? Just like those builders, their skill was, we know which way to turn the jar. That's right up their street. I love that story. That was a, a lovely punchline. Okay? But it was skill for the students to tell the builders how to calculate the volume of the receptacle that had the eggs in. Okay? All of us in life have skills at various levels in different things, and our skills will produce what our skills produce, and we should never be embarrassed at that because, um, you know, there's a crazy thing that, that, that kind of came out some years ago. I think it kind of spilled out in the 60s and 70s. And of course, we, we said, you can be anything you want to be. No, you can't. <laughs> you can't. If you're thick as two short planks, and you get altitude sickness, and you're dizzy just going round and round about, you can't be an astronaut. You can't. You can't. Okay? So we get carried away with some of this stupidity that you can be anything you want to be. Now, by all means, dream. I've been to the stars and back in my dreams. You know, I wanted to be a helicopter pilot in the Royal Navy. And I had my applications all in, but I failed it on my ears. I couldn't be a helicopter pilot because my ears were rubbish. So we have to be careful in some of these things. In several ways, first of all, saying you can be anything that you want to be can seem very encouraging, but to some people, you just heaped burden upon their back. You just said, you're a failure. You're useless. You have no purpose. I do believe all of us can be who and what we need to be. I believe everyone has been gifted and skilled to be 
what we need to be, and you do not need to be embarrassed about being who and what you need to be. You need to be proud of that and be that best person at that that you can possibly be, because not everybody is academic and not everybody is practical. Not everybody thinks well, but also not everybody makes well. Some are artists, some are not. And so in all of these things, we have to get a balance. So, so favor shouldn't be confused with, with skill. Favor cannot be measured purely in terms of visually outward success. That's the other danger we have, is to say that if a person is visually outwardly successful, they must be favored. No, they may be skilled. They may be favored, but they may be skilled. The reason I bring that balance is because then you look at somebody who may at this moment not be visually outwardly successful in either personally, corporately, relationally, and therefore your conclusion would have to be they are not under the favor of God, which then means the favor of God is earned, and bully for you, you've earned it, but they haven't, because look at your outward success, so you must be getting it right, and they must be getting it wrong. You cannot measure favor by visually outward success, although it may include that. So favor should be planned in. Everything we do, we should plan in. The favor of God is on my life. But favor cannot be worked out. Any more than grace can be worked out, but grace can be planned in. You can't work out a gift, you can receive a gift. It can be planned in. So we have to plan favor into our lives. You have been released and enabled by heaven itself to plan favor into your life. Now, one of our problems is that we don't start by planning favor into our life. And may I also say that we think that skill can get us where only favor can. There are some things you cannot reach and some things that cannot be done by skill. It has to be done by favor, just like grace, just like the gifts of God. So we have to plan that into our lives. I'm expecting the favor of God. Favor is a state or condition bestowed by someone upon someone, not by qualification, deserving, or merit, that shows up often unexpectedly in a form that best suits the requirements of the situation. That's my best shot at the moment and a bit of a definition, okay? Let me say it again. Favor is a state or condition bestowed by someone, I believe the Father in this case, upon someone, me, you, not by qualification, you do not earn the favor of God. Not by deserving. It's not about whether you deserve it because grace comes to the undeserving as well. And not on merit. That means that you reached a target at which I am then favored because that's the merit for the place that I reached. None of those apply and what favor does is it shows up often unexpectedly, but it shows up in a form that best suits the requirements of the situation. In other words, you don't get to decide how the favor shows up. It shows up because of one who sees further than you see and is bigger than you are and is more capable than your best capability, who in that favor is able to push that into our lives and say, accelerate, okay? As simple as that. But favor showing up in that moment in a way that best suits the requirements of the situation. What was the favor of God on your life, Ant, in that moment? God said, accelerate. Doesn't sound like much, does it? If I said to you, here's the word of God, favor. God said, accelerate. Doesn't sound much unless there's a rock slide coming down towards your car. Then it sounds an awful lot different 
than if I just said to you, oh, God said to me, accelerate, and I believe I'm in the favor of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we can't design favor into a shape or expression that suits our evaluation of a given situation because favor's not like that. In the same way that grace invades our world and touches us where we didn't even know we needed to be touched, favor comes into our lives to help us in moments where sometimes we didn't even know that we needed help. And it comes in reliable, trustworthy ways, okay? But one act of favor is not the end of it for your life. You have to see this more like dots on a page or a picture being made up. Favor comes as part of the picture, colors on the picture, because sometimes you can't see the whole picture, but because we can't see the whole picture, we often don't want to give credit and understand that favor was at work in our lives. I was raised with a little prayer that I used to hear. Save us from dangers seen and unseen. Only favor does that. Because you didn't even see it. You didn't even know how that was going to pan out. You didn't know what people were planning to do and say. And you never would know some of that stuff because favor delivered you from things unseen as much as seen. Here's the way one of the psalmists put it. A thousand may fall at your side. Ten thousand may fall at your right hand, but it will not come near you. When you're in the battle, you are not aware of what is happening here and here. So the psalmist was saying, stuff's going on in the favor of God that you need to sensitize yourself to, that you don't even need to know the detail of it all, but just to thank God that because favor was on your life, you could get on with this, okay? I'm making sense. Favor is a phenomenon Not controllable, yet very present. Favor is a phenomenon. A phenomenon is something that I don't know how to explain it. It's like phenomenon, isn't it? A phenomenon is something that you, is extraordinarily amazing that in essence you can't really find an adequate explanation for. Okay, so when we say it's phenomenal, it's like I can't find an adequate explanation to say what this is about. Favor is a phenomenon, okay? Which is why we wrestle with it and struggle with it because you can't actually get to grips with fully explaining what this thing is, but it is. And it's amazing, the issue is not about fully getting to grips with what it is, the issue is a determination to live in and under that favor that is going on. It's like it's here, it's around me, it's for me, he never leaves me. Okay, a couple more things. Favor is not insurance. Two, two, two words here. Favor is not insurance against things that going wrong. So things going wrong do not mean that there is no favor on your life. Because favor doesn't suddenly come in our lives and then, hey, you know, it's all suddenly the concrete starts blossoming roses and, you know, mad dogs don't bite anymore and whatever, whatever, whatever. No, favor is something present with us in the process of life. It is not insurance against things going wrong. It is assurance for when they do. So favor doesn't give me insurance against things going wrong, but it gives me assurance when they do. So when we all hit the issues of life, here's what favor does. Favor gives you assurance to say, but you are under favor. And because the favor of God is upon your life, a thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, you don't come near you. I sometimes think God wants to say, will you stop whinging about the little bit of the picture that you see and start praising and thanking about the huge part of the picture that you don't? Because more's going on than you don't see, than is ever happening that you do. But we become obsessed with our little space of battle here. A thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. 
is what the psalmist said. So favour is not insurance against things going wrong, but it's assurance for when they do. If favour is the established condition, so it's a condition established by God. Okay, so here's the deal. Listen, you lot. You are under the favour of God, okay? No, you don't get to vote on it. You don't get to debate it. You don't get to choose. You are under the favour of God. Arbitrarily, unilaterally, you are favoured by God. You can't be not favoured by God any more than you can be not graced by God and for grace not to be a gift because it's a charis. It's the same word. You are living under favour. Now I appreciate we don't always live in the full expression of the favour that rests on our life but that's part of my reason for this message that the objective is not try and get to a place where you can get the favour of God in your life. My objective is you can't get to a place where you can get it because you've already got it. But we have to learn to live in it. So if favour is the established condition, then faith, contentment, hope, and rest are some of the things that through grace allow us to provide a channel down which that favour can flow. If you think of favour flowing, and and sometimes we just need channels down which that favour can flow in our life. Faith is one of those channels. Okay, faith is not favour, otherwise we wouldn't have the Bible talking about favour and faith. We'd just have one word. But faith can become a channel. For, remember, faith is the, is, the, is the something, something, something of the something. No, that's not what I'm looking for. Faith is the determined placement of my belief and trust in the goodness and faithfulness of God. How many of you think that might become a channel down which favour will flow? Contentment. The Apostle Paul says, I've learned in whatever situation I am, in that situation, to be content. Now, there's a difference between contentment and accepting. We had a conversation about this today. Um, Contentment says... I'm where I am at the moment and I personally can't do anything to change this but I don't believe that this is where I'm meant to stay for the rest of my life. That's contentment. Acceptance says, this is where I am. I've just got to accept it. And if this is how things are, this is how things will always be. That's acceptance. That's not contentment. Okay? Contentment says, yes, this is where I am but this is not where I'm staying for one second longer than I need to in the favour of God in my life. Now, I don't know how long that stay there might be, but the contentment still has with it the sense of favour. Hope, remember, is the confident expectation that the last word has not yet been spoken. Some of you think if that's my attitude, there's a channel down which favour will flow. And I mentioned rest. I think rest is the issue. In Hebrews uh, chapter 3 and 4, it talks about the rest as resting in God, that that we come to the finished place, that we're not at rest in the sense of where we just accept everything and anything and, you know, it's just que sera, sera, things are going to be however they're going to be, but it means that within the middle of all that we're going through, we come to a place of rest because we know that he said it is finished. Even if we haven't seen a manifestation at the moment that we believe looks like finished, Jesus said, it is finished. That's the power of his creative work. So then if I have a confident expectation, the last word's not yet been spoken, and I'm content in whatever situation I am in, and I determinedly place my belief and trust in the goodness and faithfulness of God, those are channels, not all of them, but those are channels that somehow we begin to sense and feel the favor that is on our life. One of my objectives and desires tonight is not just that you know that favour has been bestowed upon you, that you begin to sense and feel the favour that is on your life, okay? So, let's, let's um, take the last furlong into the finishing post. Psalms 27 verse 13. David said these words, I had fainted, other versions say lost heart, despaired, 
unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Fainting is what happens, losing heart, despair is what happens when we stop believing to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So my contentment is not I'm content that this is happening to me. My contentment is that within all that is happening to me, I am not going to faint because I believe that I am going to see the goodness of the Lord, not in heaven, but in the land of the living. (coughs) Luke 2.52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now, I believe that verse can be misunderstood because if favor is a carif, if favor is a charis, a gift, a grace, then the truth is it is what it is. So, so I don't think that he was growing into more favor. I think that he was growing in the favor that was on his life. So he was growing into the favor that was on his life. Imagine if I brought a coat in here that was too big for you. I would want you to grow in stature. And in fact, I'd want you to grow into it, okay? So it's not an issue of as we grow, we earn more favor from God. Because then it wouldn't be a gift, would it? It would be a reward. It's that we have to learn to grow into the favor that is on our lives, okay? We grow into that coat of favor. Okay, so a hymn of faith about favor from from the well-known book of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk as the Americans wrongfully call it. Habakkuk, it's one of the, call them minor prophets. Imagine that's your claim to fame. These are the minor prophets, these are the major prophets. Oh, gee, thanks. Habakkuk 3, 17. It's even down in the NIV as a hymn of faith. Listen, he says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will join in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet. Okay, He will make. He will make. That's something that he knows is coming. He will make my feet like deer's feet. Not that that's anything you should aspire to. In the context, you have to take it poetically. And he will make, he will make me walk on my high hills. What he's saying is, I am content where I am. But because of favor on my life, I release a faith and a hope. And in that contentment and in that trust, something is flowing into me that's telling me what he will make me like. Where he will make me walk. Do you understand what he's saying? Because he's growing into the favor and making a channel for it to flow. So, we're nearly done. A good confession, if you can believe you're living under the favor of God, is something that I proposed many, many years ago uh, when we were last having this ceiling painted and we were meeting in the Baptist church across the street. I think it is still um, a very powerful confession and I think it beautifully aligns the heart, the spirit, the soul with the principle I've been talking about about the favor of God being felt and experienced and known as a reality in your life. You may never be driving along an interstate with a rock slide coming down towards the car and need to be told, accelerate. But every one of us has situations where the favor of God is what we need to encounter in that moment, okay? And so these are the confessions, and I'll throw them up for you. Okay, seven confessions. I am a blessed man. These are statements about about my condition, your condition. I am a blessed woman if you're a woman. Okay? It's not it's not a debatable am I? It's not am I, it's I am. Isn't it interesting that just changing of two words which consist of three letters can devastate or explode your life forward in expectation. Am I? I am. There's far too many am I's going on in most of your lives, and probably mine too. Am I loved? Am I able? 
Am I capable? Am I blessed? Am I favored? Three little, three letters, two words. Look what happens when you just flip it around. I am favored. I am loved. I am capable. I am blessed. See, the distance between those two is very small, but it's the distance of faith, of the willingness to get those words in the right order. And so our confessions are based on them. I am a blessed man. I am a blessed woman. The favor of God rests upon me. Where sin is big, which it usually is, grace is bigger. There are scriptures for all of these, but I'm not giving you the scriptures. In other words, you can't sin bigger than grace is over your sin. You can't. Where sin is big, grace is bigger. There are no unredeemable mistakes in my life. These are confessions that come from a life that knows that it's living in a place of favor that is gifted and graced. There are sufficient mercies introduced into my life on a daily basis to deal with anything I will encounter. That's a confession. That's not, are there enough? It's a confession. Because of the favor of God, there are sufficient mercies in your life. That comes from a wonderful scripture that says that new every morning are your mercies, O Lord my God. Your steadfast love doesn't cease. Your mercies don't come to an end. New every morning are your mercies, which means on every given day, the moment the sun arises, there are all the mercies that you need for that day accessible to you, which is why it's important to live in a place of favor. Realizing it's there and let it burst out from you. Six one, God's investment into me is endless verse that comes from says, as he has given us his son, how much more will he not also with him freely give us all things, okay? A limitless investment. I think that's favor, don't you? And the last one, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now that doesn't say I can be all things because we've already done the astronaut thing. We've already done the helicopter pilot thing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, the practicality of that is, in reality, I don't have to do all things, do I? I don't have to govern the country. I don't have to balance the economy. I don't have to do the Brexit talks. I don't... You know, I don't, have to, I don't have to run the city of York. I don't have to, I don't have to direct traffic. I don't... But of all the things that connect to my life, I can do all those things. I can do them all through Christ who strengthens me. There's nothing, I'm serious, look at me, nothing in the context of the reality of your life that you cannot do. Because Christ strengthens you to do it. Nothing you can't get through, nothing you can't get over, Nothing you can't reach for that is part of the process of your journey. When you look at that thing, you need to be saying to that thing, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Because favor is on my life. Favor, gift, grace. All the same. Favor, gift, grace. Freely you have received freely give so the end of this is not only do we live in favor but we give favor because what we freely received then we're able to give in order that people might be blessed but yes for a moment thank you father that we are absolutely unquestionably and without doubt under the most incredible dynamic expansive favor possible to ever imagine. In fact, it's greater than we can even think or imagine what you have put there. Absolutely, here on us right now, in our lives, will be with us here, be with us in the car, be with us when we get home, be with us at work. Absolutely, the favor of God. My prayer tonight, Father, is that, first of all, we will have a sense of being under that favor. Just that inner sense 
that says, I don't know what it is, but I'm under something. And that something is the favor of God. And secondly, down the channels of our life, sometimes which are no more than I believe, but help my unbelief, that down those channels, we begin to recognize what is already there. The flow of favor coming into our lives. And that we will be grateful and thankful and appreciative and expressive of this favor that we've talked about reaching to us and touching us. And now for parts of the world and and parts of the community where favor's not very felt, we thank you that it's still there, felt or not felt. And we pray a big prayer tonight that in those places where life's journey and life's circumstances have created a scenario where it's not easy to feel favor, that this supernatural phenomenon of favor will descend into hearts and lives with the peace of God that passes understanding. But for what you have done for us and in us and through us, we are exceedingly grateful. And so I say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who heals you from your diseases, satisfies your mouth with good things, crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy, and causes you to rise up with wings like the eagles. Thank you for favor today, God. May it be an ever-present reality within the context of our view and an ever-present knowledge in our hearts and spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.